Good evening. Welcome to the fourth of our Dance Palace Community Center's virtual art exhibits and the first one of this new year. So welcome to you all. Uh, my name is Lucy Vitali and I'm the newest member of the Dance Palace Art Committee. It's um, our goal is to keep providing opportunities for local artists, new and, and emerging, uh, to display and exhibit their artwork and talk about it for you. Um, of course, we've had to change our format due to the COVID, and so our lobby gallery is not open, but you can certainly look on our website and find Sydney's gorgeous quilts, beautifully photographed by Carlos Parada, another member of our committee. Um, I guess I've just had a wonderful time getting to know Sydney, and it's been a pleasure working with Laurel Ann also. Magic of technology has been foremost in my mind because I've been able, we've been able to work together even though we are not, we are very much physically distanced. Laurel Ann is all the way in Uruguay and Sydney and I have never really been able to sit together and chat about these things. So it's been really interesting. So today Sydney is going to present a chosen uh, sampling of her quilts and these are on our website on the gallery. Uh, and they're beautifully photographed by Carlos, as I mentioned. Um, the close-ups that Carlos took really detail the intricate storytelling that Sydney is doing with these quilts. At the end of each commentary, she's going to open it to questions, Sydney will, and you may submit via chat to Laurel Ann Riley, who is down in Uruguay, serving as our special events coordinator and it's been a joy working with both ladies. We'll be handing, handling those chat questions as many as we can get and um, within our time constraints we're going to try and keep this to one hour. So now I am honored to introduce to you our artist of the month, Sydney Bortel. It has been a joy getting to know Sydney and learning about quilting. Discovering her stories through the fabric and thread of her quilts has been a journey through Sydney's life and a celebration of her artistic talent. Her work is gorgeous and I'm thrilled to share it with you. All of these quilts have been exhibited in quilt shows and local galleries and have won many awards. Sydney is clearly an artist of patience and inspiration in activism. My favorite quote of Sydney's was when she told me that she was meticulous, ridiculously meticulous. And I can also feel the joy in her interpretations through her quilt work. So now, here's Sydney. Thank you, Lucy. And thank you, all of you, for coming. It's just such a thrill to see you here this evening. I want to tell you a little about where much of my journey began. In second grade, the crushing of any artistic aspiration occurred when the teacher told the class to draw a tree. I did very poorly, and the teacher decreed that I'd never be an artist. In retrospect, it appears that I sort of worked around her pronouncement by concentrating on craft projects many of which were pattern-based and many required a, a, a significant amount of obsessive determination, which I'm very good at. I used online free images when I needed an object or figure that I couldn't easily draw. Quilting classes began in 1982, and after several years, there were a few art quilts, but not until I retired from my 30 year clinical social work career in 1993, did I indulge my wish to work with more deeply saturated colors and concentrate on art quilts. When much of the public hears the word quilt, they still assume that it's the cozy, colorful, warm blanket that covers their bed. It's taken many years to modify that image to include not only traditional quilts, quilts made for the wall, but originally designed art quilts as well. Technically, and I mean only technically, all quilts, traditional or art quilts, are defined by the use of three layers, 
the top fabric, which could have been cut out of other fabrics and sewn together or pieced, as we call it, batting in the middle and a fabric backing. These layers are pinned, basted, or temporarily joined with a spray adhesive and then quilted or stitched with designs or lines over the surface by hand, by home sewing machine, or the long arm machine, which is a very large table with a movable sewing machine on top, which is moved by rollers to quilt the entire surface. For me, my home sewing, sewing machine is adequate for quilting. Time has expanded the old definitions. Many art quilts have also have designs going into borders, irregular edges, added embellishments, other trim, paints, beads, screen prints, paper, and more. The important modern quilt movement began several years ago. Abstract art quilts are a growing and exciting addition. The term fabric art includes quilts, but quilts are just a very small part of the category of fabric art. The quilts you'll see this evening are cotton top and back with a batting in the middle. The threads are cotton or polyester, many variegated or multicolored threads and sashiko thread as well. Fusible materials are used to attach many elements that you'll see or sections to the quilt tops. 10 years ago, I joined Marin Experience Corps, which is now a part of AARP, where senior volunteers 50 and over tutor public school children from kindergarten to third grade from low-income families. There are now 21 cities in the US with this program. My first eight years as a tutor took place in a school where 98% of the children are classified as English language learners. Their families were mostly Latino and live in the crowded canal area of San Rafael. The children are bused from their canal homes to school in a middle-class area of San Rafael because their local school in the canal neighborhood is full. In addition to tutoring, I made several quilts with the children, including this one, which you'll see. Their first grade teacher, who happens to be here tonight, Melanie, concerned that the students had very little awareness of their own neighborhood. She first had the students watch the Google Maps to connect their houses, to, to see their homes and, and to see the streets. And then she designed a very large three-dimensional map on brown paper, which was part of the social studies curriculum, including the streets, which you'll see, each child's home. And again, this is not the, the floor quilt. This is a quilt that I made of it, but it's similar. The local grocery store, health clinic, the park, the library, and Canal Alliance, the primary one of the nonprofit agencies serving this community. The children located their homes on the street using milk cartons, placing cardboard traffic signs, etc. The day that the floor project was complete, the children came into the classroom. They stood all around looking at it and reacted with such amazement, one boy shouting, it's about us. And I realized that this new experience of an essentially hidden minority population suddenly took the place of most of their experience of the more traditional school curriculum. That's when I decided to replace the floor project with my project, Canal Quilt, created with the children now at its home in their school. Community support and social action is especially gratifying when I can combine it with my quilting. Okay, and here's the first quilts. There are two of them. These are Ecuador quilts. And I'm going to speak first to the one on the lower one, um, 
that was the first of these quilts. Uh, we were in Quito, Ecuador's capital, on a walking tour of the country. On the first morning, we approached the Pan American Highway and were very startled to see a long line of stopped old cars, trucks, and buses surrounded by soldiers in military fatigues, pointing their rifles at the drivers of the vehicles. We knew already that an attempt to overthrow the government was going to occur, protesting dollarization and very, very serious economic survival issues. Our guide told us that protesters from all over Ecuador had arrived and planned to drive up the hill to the Capitol building at the top but the military was insisting that they turn around and drive back home. You'll see the Capitol building again on the quilt to the left next to the church at the top of the hill. The protesters defied the order, parked their vehicles and began, as you'll see on this quilt, the long walk up the mountain. What caught my eye immediately were the quilt-like irregular shaped green, yellow, and brown patches on the hill. These are the pieces of land that the government had ordered large landholders to put aside for the poor. I knew right away that this would inspire an Ecuador quilt. You'll note the walkers' traditional bowler hats, actually, of course, they were black. The brown blocks surrounding the trail were all individually sewn together. The grasses and cactus were cut from cactus and grass fabric, and the sky was sewn from a cut up and rearranged sky fabric. The women and men figures, the plants and the buildings were all fused on and sewn with a small zigzag, zigzag stitch around the edges. As we continued around the country, we encountered many primitive obstacles, such as rocks and trees on the roads, and detoured when necessary, but all seemed very peaceful until the last travel day. Our trip to the Otavalo market was canceled because rocks were being thrown at the back of tourist vehicles. To our great surprise, we learned later that the soldiers had changed sides. They were supporting the overthrow and the president had left the country. But as usually happens here, the vice president took over and apparently nothing changed. <laughs> the next quilt is called Leaves on Indigo Stones. This was the first and the most difficult of my many Japanese rectangle quilts. And it was inspired by my visit to Tacoma's Washington Art Coat Museum, Art Quilt Museum, I'm sorry, Tacoma's Washington Art Museum. The exhibit was Andy Goldsworthy's Mountain and Coast Autumn into Winter. In Goldsworthy's photo, red leaves were scattered on snow. What makes this quilt, what makes this quilt work well is the background fabric, a kind of a gray fabric with light and dark cloud-like shapes, lines and dots. The fabric shows more clearly on the top and bottom and just barely around in between the rounded rectangular blocks. What made it difficult if you'll look at these individual blocks is that I had to ad adhere or iron on freezer paper at that time, a popular way to fuse one fabric to another, to the back of each little block. Properly cut, the fabric would be one third of an inch larger than the freezer paper, so that the third of an inch could be fabric could be turned over to the back of the block to make it stable enough to be sewed on or appliqued to the back or top layer of the quilt. The problem, was if the excess cotton fabric around the, sh around the freezer paper was short of the third of an inch, it was next to impossible to tuck in the edge of the fabric and iron it down. Lesson learned, more careful cutting. The red leaves were hand embroidered and then sewn around the edges onto the top. 
the next quilt. This quilt is called Compassion. Usually when I prepare to attend a quilting workshop or class, I pack a few extra fabrics to use as possibilities for the class. This special hand dyed fabric was one of those ex extras. As I packed up and refolded this fabric at the end of the workshop, I noticed what appeared to be the outline of two figures facing one another. But since, but since I had other projects in process, I simply basted yarn to the outline of the figures and put it on the shelf. Several times I took it out and looked at it again, but I wasn't ready to work on it. By the way, we quilters are known to take out all of our fabrics from time to time, not only to view what's in our collection, but also to refold them differently. However, when I turned 80 and looked again, I asked myself, if not now, when? A friend had just the right color ribbon for the outline and I machine sewed it all around each figure. By then I knew that the relationship between the two was a helping, compassionate one. I began searching for shapes to add to the background that would be related to the figures. The chair suggested patient listening, hourglass suggested time, the hands suggested healing, and the beaded circles were pills. These shapes were fused to the quilt and a special zigzag stitched all around the edges of each one. I had to cover the white sheer hands with cotton fabric to protect them during the quilting. I cut the batting and the backing, taped the backing to the table, added the backing and the top, safety pinned the layers together and began quilting. The variegated, very, very tiny shell-like stitches, which you cannot see very well, but they're on the bottom of the male-like figure, were a replay of my careful compulsive technique. And by the time I filled that section, I realized I would regret that decision. But another friend who is an expert machine quilter suggested that use of only this one stitch would be boring. So I switched to the simpler triangles, which are on the rest of the quilt and completed the quilting more quickly. I won't be talking about other exhibits or awards with the other quilts, but this one was kind of special. It was a prize winner in Marin's 80 Artists Over Age 80 Art Exhibit a few years ago. It won Best of Show for quilts and, and, and first place for quilts and clothing in Marin County Fair's quilt exhibit and was included in the Sacred Threads show near Washington, DC. Okay, the next quilt, the next quilt. Mm. This is called White Lily. Before attending a Japanese quilt shop, taught by the way by Kitty Pippin, who is one of the best known writers of Japanese art quilt instruction books. I was offered this very special old Japanese fabric by a fellow volunteer in a group making quilts for homeless shelter residents. This is the lovely white lily and you see several of them in the quilt. My first challenge was to assemble companion fabrics for the lilies. I knew that some of my old and contemporary Japanese fabrics would work, but I needed to addition more fabrics from my collection or my stash, as we call it, to provide lines, background, and top and, bo and bottom borders. Actually, one of the treasures, can you even see it? Uh, yeah, you can, was the yellow and white diagonal fabric that picked up the yellow in the flowers. By the way, auditioning fabric involves pulling any or all fabrics from your stash that might work from your current plan and chosen primary fabric, tossing rejected fabrics aside or sometimes on the floor 
and pinning those that survive on your design wall next to the selected initial and important fabric. My design wall is a very large piece of white flannel attached near the top of one whole wall in my studio. Since I have a very large stash, this process I describe can go on until I find one or more fabrics that are likely to work. And when I'm stuck, I find the tra traditional color wheel very helpful when I need more input. The next day, getting up in the morning, I walk into my studio with my very essential hot cup of coffee and reevaluate the selection. I often do the same thing all during the process of construction of a quilt, often revising with fresh eyes and coffee, of course. Looking at the wide top and bottom borders, you'll see sashiko embroidery. Sashiko is what was originally called the stab stitch, a long running stitch and used in mending fabric before the 1880s in Japan when new cotton fabric and thread were not available. Indigo fabric was used for most garments and thread pulled from the actual garment was then used to mend. But when white cotton thread appeared, sashiko, sashiko could become more decorative with white designs and emblems embroidered against indigo fabric. You'll see that heavier thread on the top and bottom borders, the wide borders. All the remaining quilting on this quilt, which you can't see except you see some sort of sashiko designs, but it's all done by hand. As in many art quilts, turned under facing is used on the edges rather than full borders and traditional binding. Okay, the next quilt. This quilt is called Serenity. Many years ago, I completed the Sashiko embroidery blocks in a class. I was very pleased with them, but I never had, I was never sure what I wanted to do with them. And somewhat indignantly refused uh, advice to use them as placemats. I had seen an interesting boro or Japanese style mending piece at a quilt show. And that's what I had in mind until I pulled these older blocks off the shelf once again and considered what I might do with them. Five blocks weren't enough unless I combined them with other fabrics. After some auditioning, I added a piece of kimono sleeve that contained a very tiny tea stain, plus another old kimono piece, which I had picked up from the Japan flea market. Two more newer, newer kimono pieces and a very thin old piece of cotton that was part of an old Japanese purse. But the final addition is what gives the quilt its punch. I had purchased an indigo hand-painted t-shirt and it was too long for me. Those extra inches worked perfectly on the top row. The quilting by intention is very minimal. And this is the last quilt coming. This is called In a Japanese Temple Garden. This garden may have been the most beautiful of all the Japanese temple gardens we visited. However, the Tori Gate that I included in it may actually have been the entrance to a Shinto shrine. When we entered the garden, and this is not in this quilt, when we entered the garden, my eye caught a gardener sitting at the top of a pine tree, trimming pine needles and a closer look revealed that he was actually cutting one needle at a time. You get the feeling of Japan. The sky is an example of pieces that were cut from an actual sky fabric and sewn together differently, as were the foreground and the path. I'll explain fusing in more detail here, since the technique dominates the entire quilt. 
fusing consists of ironing on an adhesive backed thin paper like material to the back of the piece or section of the fabric to be attached, pulling the paper off when it's dry, and then carefully ironing the fused piece into the top fabric. Small sections of leaves, which you'll see all over this quilt, were actually part of the bamboo fabric, each cut out from the fabric and individually fused and sewn around the edge of every little bunch. Mount Fuji was barely visible until a friend gave me the perfect metallic variegated thread. The monks were an afterthought for balance. Thank you. Thank you, Sydney. Um, and we actually have a question about this quilt. So I'm wondering if you'd want to take it now. Should we move into the questions? Sure. All right, so it's a question from Carol Whitman saying, wow, this is amazing. How big are the pieces on the bottom? Also those little leaves? Uh, the leaf, um, did you ask, the pieces on the bottom are about uh, an inch and a quarter on each side. And you asked about the leaves? Yes, I think that- Carol? <laughs> yeah, the leaves were the little leaves that were on the bamboo fabric. And you can kind of tell by comparing them, they were very small. Um, so yes, they all had to be, a little section had to be fused and then zigzagged around the edges so that they wouldn't fray. That's beautiful, thanks. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. And there's one more question about this quilt before we move into general questions um, from Carlos Parada. How long did this quilt take to make? I knew somebody would ask <laughs> that. <laughs> As you can imagine, it wasn't quick, um, partially because my quilts are rarely, never actually quilt, but partially because um, there was so much work. And so much of it was, as I described it to you, a little boring. So um, many, many months, um, certainly not, not a year. But again, because I had completed it, Mount Fuji at that point didn't have that nice um, metallic variegated fabric on the top. And even though Mount Fuji is in the distance, I wanted it to show and the monks weren't in it and something seemed missing. So that was something that I added on maybe several months later. <clears throat> Thank you wow. for that. Um, I just wanted to let you know, since I'm the one on the chat, um, that you're getting a lot of compliments. Um, this is so delicate. All your quilts are beautiful. You're so talented. Um, an amazing artist, the fabrics are exceptional too. And then there's a question here from Eileen Marion. Um, are the leaves raw edge? Yes, yes. This, these, um, these leaves, well, let me, let me say that the, yeah, the leaves are all raw edge. And again, that is why I had to stitch around them um, so that they wouldn't fray. And the same thing is true with the bamboo trees. Um, everything that was fused on needed to be um, zigzagged, a very tiny, almost invisible zigzag stitch around the edges to stop fraying. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing screen so that we can see you. Um, cause there are a few, there are several questions here in the chat. Let's see, um, a comment from Douglas and Carol Sheft. Good to see you after all this time. Beautiful work, Sydney. Thank you. <laughs> and here's a question from Tyler. Um, how many quilts are you usually working on at a given time? Tyler is my oldest grandson. <laughs> Hi Tyler up there in Portland. Um, it depends. Sometimes just one, sometimes there are two or three. Um, if there's a deadline for a quilt show or something, then it's 
you know, that's it, day or night, however long I have to finish it, but it varies. Great. That was a good question. I was curious about that too. <laughs> um, here's a, qu a question from Nancy. Can you tell us about the quilt behind you on the wall? <laughs> oh, thank you, Nancy. Nancy is one of those friends who helped out on these quilts. <laughs> Um, usually that is my design wall. You see the white in the background, the white flannel on that wall. And usually that wall is covered with bits and pieces, trials and errors. I have photos of all of my family on the top of the quilt, on the top of the wall. So I pulled it all off, put it away temporarily. And I, what you're seeing is actually two quilts. The one in the back, um, cor church, courtyard church steps is a traditional quilt that has those squares on it with a lot of um, very colorful, different colored beads. When I put that up and I looked at it on a Zoom um, program, it just was too bright. So I put up a quilt on top of it. And that is a quilt that is a Japanese one piece fabric. Um, it has on it those round circles that have some gold to it. Um, in addition, and you can't see this, which is one reason I didn't show this quilt this evening because I have a stitched gold metallic Japanese emblems, traditional ones all around the quilt. And there are several hundred, the smallest uh, bead seeds, seed beads, I should say, stitched in about 40 rows up and down the quilt. Now, if you ask me how long that quilt took, it was many years because the stitching of those beads was just, never mind. <laughs> it was just hard. It was just long. <laughs> well, I would like to interject. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, um, so I think what people may not realize, Sydney, is how labor intensive this stuff really is. When you look at face value at a quilt, you might think, you, you might not even think how long it takes, but it's got to be an incredible amount of time. And I, I hope you'll share the story of quilting in bed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> in my early days of quilting, I had made a little traditional wall quilt to go in our dining room. By the time that that was almost finished, we had already changed the color of paint in the dining room and the quilt no longer worked there. Now, I'm not one who feels that the color of a quilt has to match your room, but in this case, it would have looked really strange. So naive as I was, I decided I could just enlarge it and make it into a quilt for our king size bed upstairs. So I added borders and borders and more borders. Um, I was totally, I was hand quilting the whole thing. My cousin, an artist from New York, who's also here, made beautiful baskets of flowers for me to quilt around the biggest border on the bottom. This went on for several years. I finally decided I would never finish it at this rate. So I brought it upstairs and I put it on the bed and I decided that every night before I went to sleep, I would do more hand quilting on it. My husband likes to tell that every time he turned over, he got stuck by pins. That's a lie, of course, but you get it. I, I think, Lucy, that's what you were asking. <laughs> Absolutely delightful. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> I love it. Uh, yeah. 
We have a couple questions about sizes. Um, I think of the last couple quilts, um, or there's one question about the overall size of this last quilt, which I think they're referring to the last one that was shared on the screen. And then there's a later question about the one on the wall, um, what sizes they are more or less. On the, okay. Um, the, you're, you're asking about the Japanese garden, that the last quilt, yeah. That one I would say is about um, 26 inches by uh, 38 inches, that's my guess, okay? And this one on the wall, um, let me turn around and look at it. It's about three and a half to four feet wide and the same, the same, about the same measurement, maybe a couple of more inches vertically. Great, thank you. Um, there, there are a couple comments that I, I want to share the comments too, you know, because <laughs> they're all really sweet. Um, lovely job, Sydney. I love seeing you. And of course, your incredible quilts once again from Miriam. Um, Nina says, amazing colors feel authentic to the places and subjects. <laughs> and then there's a question here from Georgia asking, what inspires your quilts beyond some of your travels? There are so many. I'll mention my quilt guild first. Uh, I'm a member of Mount Tam Quilt Guild, which is a, a Marin guild. And you can tell from what I say about this friend and that friend that the quilt guild and the quilters in it are a wonderful support for anyone who is involved in, in this kind of art. Um, you mentioned travel, classes, quilt shows, that is, that's important. Whenever you go to a quilt show, you'll get an idea or many ideas of something you want to do. Um, when we go to a good quilt show, many of us take a lot of pictures of the quilts just to kind of keep them in our heads because it's so over overwhelming. The other thing is when, if you look at the quilts that Lucy was describing, um, uh, the photos of the quilts that Carlos so generously took, you will see that he did close-ups, as Lucy said, of different places of a few of the quilts. So in that way, you'll see the quilting more closely. So I suggest you do that. Yeah, I just wanted to echo that. The detailed pictures are amazing. I know this is all online. And if this were in person, you'd be able to like put your face close up and check it out. So um, the, the online gallery is, is really cool because you can see those details. Um, and I have a question here from Rich Clark. Um, I'm curious if aspects of your 30 years of clinical practice have shown up in your quilting. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's a big question, Rich. <laughs> um, yes and no. Uh, I think, you know, especially in the first quilt that you saw, the canal quilt, um, my pleasure at being able to integrate my quilting with a work that I do that I feel is important to help situations, you know, emotionally, socially, politically, all of that, that has shown up. Other than that, um, you know, it's, it's the beauty that I see everywhere, the West Marin, Point Reyes area. You know, I haven't shown you all the quilts, but basically, um, I don't know that I can say more than that. Although certainly, you know, the Compassion quilt, I guess that would be the one that would qualify for what you're asking, Rich. Um, so I've been going in order with the questions, but there are a couple of questions that are related to what you just talked about. So um, kind of going off of inspiration and point Reyes, um, there's a question from Aaron about how has living in a forest influenced your work? 
<laughs> oh, that's a good one. <laughs> Yeah, my husband says she hasn't done a fire quilt yet. <laughs> As some of you may not know, we had a rather large fire in Inverness in the past few months. Um, no homes were burned, but it was quite spectacular. Um, you know, when I get up in the morning, one of the things I love about our home in Inverness is the view. It's a view of Bear Mountain. Um, and I use my camera to take pictures of the cloud formation, the sunrise. Um, it's just spectacular. And they never come out very well. It's not the iPhone, it's the distance and the light, etc. But I'm always capturing um, bits of inspiration when I'm out there, when I hike. Um, just, it, it's just an amazing wonderfully quiet, supportive place to be. There is one quilt that may come though, and I do, Erin, have to mention that, you've never seen this photo, but many years ago, I took a photo of a tree that was next to our house. Actually, it, it had to be cut down a few, few years later. And the shadow of the tree looked like a ghost leaning up against the house. I still have that photo. I haven't figured out what to do with it, but things like that, um, I just file until, until I can use them or have a dream about something that tells me, gives me a possibility. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, and this is kind of related to what you're talking about a little a little further back um, in terms of your gallery, but um, someone's wondering how many quilts, Pamela is wondering how many quilts are you showing at the Dance Palace? I'm showing all of these quilts plus um, two more, I think two more. Yeah, so most of them you will have seen, um, you know, you'll, you'll see the close-ups but there are one or two, well, actually this, this quilt, um, the black quilt on the wall is in that as well as another quilt, which is other than red leaves on indigo stones, um, a more traditional um, Japanese rectangle quilt. And I think it's one of the best ones that I've done. Thank you for that. And I just wanted to clarify for folks who are asking in the chat about the gallery viewing. Um, right for now, the Dance Palace um, is not physically showing in the in the physical lobby gallery. Um, these are online. Um, so yeah, to answer those questions. And there is this, like Lucy mentioned in the beginning, an amazing bio um, about Sydney. So there's, yeah, it's definitely worth checking out. Um, and we have a question from Krista. Might you publish a book of your fabulous quilts? Probably not. <laughs> this, this program is my book, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> um, there are a few more comments uh, from Christy. It's wonderful to hear the stories behind these beautiful quilts. Thank you. And Marilyn loves seeing and hearing all about Sydney's work. Such a gift. Um, Thank you. Christy <laughs> is one of my wonderful daughters-in-law. And Marilyn, I haven't seen you for a long time, but it's so nice to see you here. <laughs> um, and with that, there are a few more comments that I, I'm going to read. Um, but if folks have other questions that you want to start thinking about or writing in the chat so that we have enough time to get to them, now would be a good moment. Um, Kathy says, it's been such a delight to see your quilt, Sydney. Thank you for your detailed description of your creating process. Um, and Pam says, absolutely stunning, Sydney. Thank you for sharing your beautiful stories and beautiful work. You're truly an inspiration. And then mm -hmm. asking about the Dance Palace opening. So um, last comment here would be from Eileen. Um, as always, your pieces are very inspirational. Thank you, Eileen. Um, Lucy, do you have any questions over there? 
Um, not really. I, I guess my one question would be, would you tell a little bit more about Sashiko? Because I had no idea what that was until I met you and you explained it. And it's something that when I first saw White Lily, I was drawn to that embroidery on the bottom and top and that's what it is. So if you could tell a little bit more about that process, I would appreciate it. You said it was called the simple stab or something? Well, in, in the 1800s, in the beginning, it was called stab stitch. It's basically a running stitch, uh, rather, well, you, you saw it in the, um, the indigo quilt, you saw the size of it. Many traditional designs are sashiko designs, and you saw some of those in, in the um, white lily quilt, top and bottom. Um, it, it's, the challenge of sashiko is to make your stitches even. And that's, that's the skill that you try to develop. Um, I've told you a little bit about the history of it. There are many, many traditional designs and design, design can just be series of lines going in, you know, patterned directions. Um, I'm not sure what else I can tell you about it, other than the fact that the thread is not as thick as normal string, but it's sort of on the way to that thickness compared with sewing thread, um, with cotton sewing thread. Mm -hmm. mm. Does that help? Yeah, that does. I wonder though, is, is there much uh, dismantling <laughs> when you make a mistake? Do you have to tear it out or how, how did that come? I mean, how, how did you get? <laughs> I, I don't yes. know, I've done certain things and I know how frustrating. Unequivocally, Lucy. Yeah. <laughs> yes, lots. And that's why those, those rectangles um, were very special. And that's why I was a bit irate about the idea of using them as placements. <laughs> I hear you. That makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Can you hear me? Uh, cousin Linda. Um, I think hi, I, Linda. Hi. I thought uh, I, I came in. I have, I'm sorry. I can't have to, have to come in late. But do you uh, do you have any catalogs of your work? No, Linda, I don't. Linda is my very dear friend and my cousin from New York. She's the one that designed the basket of flower patterns for that quilt that was sticking Alan in our bed. <laughs> I love that story. Um, this, this feels kind of related. I had totally skipped over this question, but um... It's from Andrea. Um, do you sketch out the forms beforehand or do you make the shapes with fabric? Um, generally, I work directly with the fabric. You know, I will take a piece of fabric, I'll fold it in triangles, whatever, just, you know, or just throw it up on the design wall and, and just see what happens. I've never done a lot of drawing of my art quilts, although um, in the last several months, I've been taking a class in abstract art and abstract using fabric as well as paper. And you can bet that is, most of that is drawing in terms of making, making plans and learning how to provide abstraction from from a form, something I've seen or a photo that I've taken. Mm -hmm. Thank you nice. for that answer. <laughs> um, I, so I see a lot of amazing comments and I want everyone to know that I will be sharing the chat with Sydney afterwards in case I'm not able to read all of them out loud today. Um, I'm gonna prioritize questions for now so that we can um, kind of keep it conversational. But anyway, your comments will be shared with Sydney. <laughs> Um, so there's a question here from Eileen. Are you still working on Japanese themed quilts and do you have some other themes on the go? <laughs> well, Eileen knows that she and I are about to take another class 
uh, working with not necessarily Japanese themes, but certainly Japanese fabrics. Um, I and one reason I am I I am taking that class at Eileen's suggestion and at my friend Anne's suggestion is that I am now that I am 83 and I have so much Japanese fabric. Um, I have more than I will ever use. And that's one of the reasons that I'm taking this class because um, I, there's a lot. I think that's probably in addition to the abstract quilts, abstract art quilts, that's probably the other direction that I will be going. But who knows, you know, I'll trip over something else and that may, who knows what will be inspired. The other thing is I just love to do something that is needed and helpful and contribute something to the world, our local world, the broader world. And if there's an opportunity for something like that, that will probably become part of what I do for the rest of my life. Sydney, I'd like to mention that you shared with me that you're kind of following in your parents' footsteps as far as giving back. Do you want to mention that a little bit? Um, sure. My family, now we're, I was born in 37, born in Chicago. We moved to Los Angeles when I was four. We moved to Los Angeles because this was during the war and my dad, who worked in the post office in Chicago, needed another job. So I sat in the back of our little car and we drove to LA. Um, my parents became very involved in social action, concerns about the local world community in the peace movement. Um, I think I went on, I, I can't tell you how many demonstrations. It was a very hard time to be of that political persuasion. Um, I'm sure many of you know about the House on American Activities Committee, the McCarran Committee. Um, it was hard growing up in that environment. And I learned the hard way to kind of hide aspects that were, that felt dangerous, or I guess, you know, what I mentioned to Lucy is when I was, maybe in my bio, when I was in elementary school, um, we used to get the weekly reader every week. And that was about what, what was going on in the news. And there was an article about whether, the question was whether or not train engineers should have two engineers rather than just one in the in in the car and i said yes i thought so and she asked why and i said well you know one of them could have a heart attack <laughs> and she just laid into me that was so ridiculous that was so stupid why had i why would i say anything like that the other thing that i remember specifically in that lovely elementary school I think fifth grade, um, presidential nomination election. That was the time when the Independent Progressive Party was on the scene, uh, certainly a minority party, leftist. Um, and so, so we did a, you know, teacher just said, how many are voting for this one or this one or this one? <laughs> And, you know, at that point, I should have known better having been put down uh, and been concerned about visibility during those years. But I did mention that I, my vote would be for the Independent Progressive Party, the IPP, as we called it. And again, I got that similar kind of, a, you know, what's wrong with you response. So, you know, that contributed to growing up, but kind of scared. And um, it really wasn't until I found uh, a place among a population of young people that where I felt I belonged and much safer. And, 
Yeah. Does that does that tell it, Lucy? <laughs> sure does. Yep. I love that you're carrying on what you grew up with. It's it's beautiful. There's something to be said about growing old. You know, mm. <laughs> <laughs> older. You kind of just don't care. Um, for me, I'm certainly much more secure, uh, much more outspoken, as some of my neighbors and friends know. <laughs> um, yeah, that's one advantage of growing older. Beautiful. Thank you. Well, it's about that time. I, I don't know if Lucy or Sydney, you want to I can pass it over to Lucy if, if we're ready for that. Sure, I, I just or want to. He has anything you want to say first, sorry. Uh, yes. Lucy, do you want to tell people how to get to the Dance Palace site to see the exhibit? I don't sure. think. And I will be that? posting that in the chat now. So people want to. Great. Yeah, good, okay. Okay, yeah, because LA also, please mention that the previous three shows that we've done with the Dance Palace are also available. And it's really cool to go back and look at those. Um, that's a, really a neat thing that we have to be able to go back and check it out. And I also wanted to mention, thanking you for coming. Also be ready in February. We have tentatively Shirley Salzman. Actually, she is going to be our artist, but we just don't know a date or a time yet, but we will. So we'll keep you posted. Thanks again for coming. Sydney, do you want to say anything before I close out? Gratitude. It's just pure gratitude. Also being finished, I'm very thankful. Ooh. But to see so many of you, my, my family, my neighbors, my friends, my Quilt Guild members, of important people from West Marin and from Inverness and all the rest of you who who came just to see the show. Thank you so much. This is a wonderful way to see people who you love, who you haven't seen for a long time and to see them in your own home. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Um, well said, and thank you. Yeah, I just want to echo what what both Lucia and Sydney said. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming, and thank you so much, Sydney, for for sharing um, your story, your quilts. Um, I just have a few things I want to mention before we close out. Um, so, as Lucy mentioned, um, you this will be recorded, and it will go up in the next couple of days on the Dance Palace um, YouTube channel. So you can check out past receptions, including this one. Um, before folks go out, I also want to tell you that Sydney is selling these amazing greeting cards with um, her quilts printed on them. So I, I put a link in the chat and you will also be receiving an email with all this information tomorrow. Um, please contact her at the email that I listed in the chat and a portion of the proceeds goes to support the Dance Palace. Um, what else? I think that's Donate. it. Um, yeah, so finally, I want to say that the Dance Palace, but, yeah, exactly. Um, I want to say that the Dance Palace have been enjoying creating online community events and classes and really appreciates donations so that we can keep making these events um, accessible to anyone who's interested. So thank you for your support. I put uh, the link to donate uh, there in the chat. And we look forward to seeing you next month for Shirley Saltzman's um, reception in February. So. Thank you once again. I hope you have a great rest of your night and see you next month. Take care.